Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is Will Taiwan Fight Part 2? We had such a great show last week um, with Wendell Minnick uh, that we invited him back this week to continue the conversation we're having then. Uh, as you probably remember from last week, Wendell has lived in Asia for quite a long time, especially in Taiwan. He used to work for Jane's Defense Weekly. Uh, then he was longtime um, bureau chief for Defense News, and now he works for Shepherd Media Military. So we're really glad to have him back with us. Uh, good to have you again, Wendell. Well, thank you. Great. Well, at the end of last week's show, we were talking about when we ran out of time, as usually seems to be the case. Um, we were talking about what would happen if China were able to, that is mainland China, were able to take over the deep water port of Suwell, uh, which is located on Taiwan's east coast. So I, I think maybe that's a good place to start. We'll just start there and um, see what your thoughts are about that. Well, just to back up a little bit, um, China sees Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines as, as what is termed as the Great Wall of Sea. Uh, they don't have a direct line of sight to the Pacific for their Navy and Air Force. So they'll have to go around these, these geographic uh, problems by going around Taiwan, around Japan. Um, so they have to break through this chain, and the best way to do it is, is to take Taiwan, either by um, peaceful means or military means, it doesn't matter. But once you establish PLA bases on Taiwan, you can project force into the Pacific and disrupt lines of communications, sea lanes of communication up and down between Korea and Japan and uh, Middle East oil, of course which is what they, they certainly could do it in the South China Sea. But if you look at Taiwan, yeah, they got some great bases uh, on the uh, west or east coast of the Pacific. One is called Suau. And it's a deep water port that just drops into the abyss. That certainly would make a great submarine base for the, uh, for the Chinese. Another one is Walian Air Base, which is underground inside a hollowed out mountain. Mm. Another great opportunity for the Chinese to establish air power over the Pacific. Um, there are other facilities along the mountain there. Of course, you could establish signal intelligence, electronic warfare, and over the horizon, radar, and all kinds of things there. So it's it's a you know losing Taiwan would really disrupt U.S. power in the region. You know, it seems to me that that's not significantly enough appreciated by the folks in Washington. Well, politics have changed in America. It's almost unrecognizable. Uh, the Cold War is over and people have moved on. Um, uh, it just seems to be a different world back home in terms of political, strategic concerns. It's still uh, Middle East um, terrorism and Middle East crisis. Um, and the mainland Chinese have been very clever. They haven't really been that aggressive. They've been assertive of their territorial claims in the South China Sea and East China Sea, but they've been careful to avoid the U.S. Navy. Um, so as long as we don't see them as a physical or existential threat to our power, um, what some scholars are called salami slicing, mm -hmm. where you, you slice off a small bit at a time. And it goes unnoticed after a while. And before you know it, the uh, South China Sea is gone. Um, this is something they're certainly attempting to do with Taiwan, uh, not just strategically, but they're certainly trying to do it economically uh, by buying property and investing and using surrogates for this sort of thing. Surrogate. So we could lose uh, Taiwan, not just explain through that. military what, invasion, what we could lose it through politics, economics, economic coercion. Um, but any way we do lose it, we do lose a, a vital chain in that uh, U.S. Um, U.S. military line of uh, line of uh, I won't call it the battle line, but uh, uh, you know keeps the Chinese encumbered from entering the Pacific. Good. 
But you talked about surrogates just a minute ago. Um, explain uh, what type of surrogates, who are the surrogates? Well, many of the folks here uh, who, I'll go, who will go unnamed, um, who are, there are members of the legislature and the politic politicians here who own factories and businesses in China. There are people uh, I've met on the defense committee on the legislature here that own property and, and, and businesses in China. So that sort of economic coercion is there. Um, and that's a huge problem. Uh, China would, would has something like 2 million uh, Taiwanese alone living in Shanghai. Um, you know, they have their own little Taiwan town, if you want to call it. Right, right, right. So there's tremendous amount of influence and interaction at the economic level. Um, so, uh, you know, it's very dark, actually, uh, in terms of influence. The, the Chinese have been very clever. They the don't actually Chinese have to really invade the island. They don't have to dangle the money in front of people, don't they? Uh, I, I'm not quite sure that came through. Um, the mainland Chinese really know how to dangle the money in front of people. That's right. They, they, they certainly do. They, it's, it's money... Uh, it, it's, uh, they certainly have the capability of buying Taiwan. Um, and in some cases, that's already started. Um, property prices are rising here because of the potential uh, speculation, real estate speculation, that China will come in and begin buying property. So uh, that's one of the reasons property is so expensive in Taipei and other places in Taiwan. It always shocks me that the rents are actually very cheap in Taiwan, but to buy someplace is terribly expensive, especially in Taipei. Well, that's because the rents um, are not recorded as a tax. Um, I pay rent to my, my landlord, but he doesn't record it. It's cash. Now, I'm not getting anybody in trouble, but, but everyone does that. And there's no tax on real estate here, property tax. So you can own land and sit on it. You can own an apartment building and not rent it out to anyone. So when you drive through Taipei, you see a lot of empty buildings. Um, they don't ha they're not forced to rent it out. There's no property tax. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Well, um Okay, another big feature of the Taiwan military establishment is their quest to build a submarine, uh, an indigenously produced submarine. And I, I wonder what your view is on that. How's it going? Well, uh, part of the uh, arms package that the U.S. is expected to release uh, sometime this year will have a lot of that equipment available, made available to the Taiwanese, at least that's my understanding. Um, but yeah, the Taiwanese are committed uh, to building um, something like six to eight platforms. Um, they have uh, in their in their sites possibly selling these platforms, continuing to build them and sell them elsewhere, but I don't think that the competition out there will allow that to happen. Um, the U.S. Navy is not really all that crazy about Taiwan building submarines. Um, it just means more submarines in the water for them to keep track of. Um, a lot of countries in the region are buying submarines and it just makes, it's just very underwater in terms of underwater congestion. Um, there's gonna be an accident eventually. Somebody's gonna run, run into somebody. So yeah, they're going to build the subs. There's, I, I believe that they're going forward. After, gosh, you know, 2001, when they finally, you know, Bush administration finally released submarines to Taiwan. The package that you talked about, um, did you suggest that it's going to have parts and instruments and electronic components, etc., that Taiwan needs to build its submarine? Well, yeah, they lack a lot of these sort of sophisticated um, technical aspects of submarines. So they'll be, my understanding is they'll be requesting periscope stuff and yeah, 
Where they're going to test these submarines, I don't know. Uh, the U.S. has a testing facility. Maybe they'll allow them to do it. Um, but, yeah, it, to build four to eight submarines is really very expensive um, endeavor. It's much easier to buy used ones and refurbish them. And, but they refuse to do that, uh, even though they've had several opportunities to, to, to do so. Um, could you elaborate um, on that? Uh, who, yeah. Who's been willing to sell them secondhand uh, submarines? There was uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, there was an offer from uh, a European country to sell them refurbished submarines. Was that Italy? Mm -hmm. Italy, right? I believe it was Italy. I don't want to say the country for sure, but today that would be impossible with China's economic influence in Europe. Uh, but that was their last opportunity to, to get submarines from another country. After that, there really wasn't any opportunities. And the United States doesn't build diesel electric submarines. Uh, we certainly could do it, uh, but, and there's certainly uh, some folks in the US Navy that would might like to have diesels. Um, they are quieter. Uh, do we really need a long range patrol? You know, we can use more uh, short-range patrols uh, rather than go nuke all the way. There's a there's a there's a huge debate within the U.S. Navy about this issue. Let's take a break here. Um, you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today, again, uh, he was with us last week, is Wendell Minnick. He's a wealth of information on Taiwan defense issues. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Aloha, my name is Raya Salter, and I'm the host of Power Up Hawaii, which you can see live from 1 to 1.30 every Tuesday at thinktechhawaii.com and then later on YouTube. I am an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. And on Power Up Hawaii, we come together to talk about how can Hawaii walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. To do that, we talk to stakeholders all over the spectrum, from the clean energy technology folks, to community groups, to politicians, to regulators, to the utility. So please join us Tuesdays at 1 o'clock for Power Up Hawaii. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, go, go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is Will Taiwan Fight, Part 2. Our guest again, uh, joining, uh, joining us again from Taipei, Taiwan via Skype is Mr. Wendell Minnick. Uh, he is the Senior Asia Correspondent for Shepherd Media Military. Um, well, let's just finish up on the submarine thing. Now, I, I've, I've heard that lots of folks have advocated that Taiwan acquire, build miniature submarines, something like the, this is almost dangerous to say, the North Koreans have or the Iranians have. And, uh, but they don't seem to go along with that. Um, the Taiwan military is still a conventional minded military and asymmetrical and unusual operations um, that's why they want Aegis combat systems on a destroyer, even though they have real no practical use for them. Um, they're not an uh, international navy. Um, they only have to fight in the Taiwan Strait and around the Taiwan Strait. Um, so they they still think in in big terms and in, in big equipment. Mm. Um, they want the F-35s. They want submarines. They want uh, Aegis combat systems for their, their destroyers. Um, it's not clear why they want destroyers. Um, they're very big platforms today, and they're so close to the mainland already that the anti-ship anti missiles can hit them very quickly from land-based and air-launched air from China. 
Um, I don't know. Uh, and sometimes it's 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 sort of an ego thing uh, within the military to get these systems, these bigger systems. I've heard it said that the Taiwan Navy sees itself as a miniaturized U.S. Navy, and I guess that goes along with what you're saying. Um, you know, um, last week we were talking about Taiwan's will to fight, which is incidentally the title of today's show. You, you had a pretty dim view of that. And um, some folks I've been talking to say, well, the Army might lack a will to fight, but the Navy is much more professional, is much more gung-ho. Would, would you buy into that? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Yeah, when I was talking about the will to fight last week, I was talking, for the most part, the conscription of these folks in the Army um, and how the... Uh, how these kids don't really want to get involved in this. Uh, Air Force and Navy are more technical, and yet, you know, they're smaller, and they get to, you know, they, get, they, they interact with the U.S. a great deal more than the Army does. Um, mm. There's no question, but the problem with the Navy is that what are they going to do in a war? Where are they going to deploy to? Um, you know, it only takes seven minutes to cross the Taiwan Strait in a fighter jet. Mm. Uh, what are these ships going to do? Are they going to? <laughs> I mean, you've got eight Perry class frigates. You got four Kid class destroyers. You got um, you got these old Knox class frigates. You have patrol boats, of course. Um, you have eight or nine Knox, uh, sorry, Lafayette class frigates. Uh, yeah, they have a lot of ships, but um, what are they going to do during a war exactly? Uh, what is their strategy? Mm. Um, they're not projecting force beyond the straits. If they want to go to the South China Sea, they have to deal with the Chinese Navy. Um, you know, they really should focus on a smaller Navy capable of uh, using smaller missile patrol boats, corvettes like the one they just built, mm -hmm. uh, the stealth, cor cor uh, stealth corvette they built. Right. Um, that was an excellent platform, armed to the teeth with anti-ship missiles. Um, but a bigger platform than that, I honestly don't think they need. Um, anti-ship uh, missile technology in China is advanced at a rate that is mind-boggling. Uh, they now have ballistic missile uh, capability for anti-ship. Um, not that they'll bother using it on, on the Taiwan ships, but... That is for the U.S. Navy and anybody else who wants to interfere with us, um, what, for, with what the about, Taiwanese um, okay. invasion. Um, but yes, the Navy, the, the Taiwan Navy is the more professional, as is the Air Force. Okay, sounds good. Um, let me see, you've got a couple ways to could go here. Um, there is some talk. Um, I, I saw an article recently, and I forget just where I saw it, and um, it was written by Eunuk Wu, and he was, who I'm sure you know, because you introduced me to him, actually, and he was advocating a return of conscription um, to Taiwan, full-fledged conscription, not mm -hmm. this four months and go home stuff and then show up uh, for reserve meetings. Mm. Do you think there's any, and, and you know, from what I understand, Tsai Ing-wen is not averse to that idea, but it's very hard for her to push ahead on that because a large part of her base is young people who, as you've said, are not particularly enthused with military service. But is there well, any possibility mm. that Taiwan might bring back a more traditional conscription? I think it, that... He is right that they need they need bodies to fill these ro these positions. Um, but like I also said last week, they also need to improve the quality of serving in the military, and that means living a normal life like regular U.S. military people do with their families in family housing and and with the educational opportunities and other things they don't have here in Taiwan. Um, that's the only way you're going to keep good people in the military. Mm. Um, the horror stories I hear about the NCO program are pretty scary. 
um, and, you know, um, many of them should be let go. Um, it is also the generational shift issue from the, the old KMT leadership now to a more Taiwan identity mindset. Um, but the Taiwanese will really have to have a crisis before they they be concerned enough to bring back conscription. Um, something like the Taiwan Missile Crisis in, in 96 uh, might be one of these examples, but I don't think the Chinese will be that that foolish enough to, to do something like that, mm. to scare them uh, that bad. Uh, I think they'll do what they continue to do. The Chinese will continue to um, slowly uh, take advantage of China or Taiwan's economic and opportunities and just buy the whole lot. Um, I think you have you something know. there. I think it definitely has something. Salami slicing at its best. Well, let's uh, move on here because time is racing on. And um, uh, let me see, you've got a couple of ways we can go here. What about espionage in the military? Um, it seems to me that's a concern of yours. Well, I've always been interested in espionage. <laughs> Uh, period. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I've always written about it, and the most recent case in the United States is in a, a very fascinating one. But um, yes, um, I would say the Taiwan military has been completely, um, completely taken by the Chinese espionage community. Um, they have arrested uh, spy after spy after spy in some of the most critical areas of the Taiwan military, including the air defense upgrade, the Anyu-4, the Boshong C-4 program mm. upgrade. Right. Um, they have, they've, they've got, they can turn the lights on and off at will. Um, and so it, it's pretty much completely compromised, uh, the espionage factor. Here in Taiwan. You know, the other side of the coin is, at one time, Taiwan had fairly robust intelligence operations of its own on the mainland. But my sense is those have all been wiped out. Counted. Yeah, about six years ago, they wiped them out. Uh, Military Intelligence Bureau lost about, oof, gosh, about 30 guys got picked up at the same time. Um, it might be. Uh, uh, there are, there, the horror stories are, are, are massive. Uh, one year, the National Security Bureau personnel director retired and moved to China and disappeared. We don't know where he is or what he's doing. Personnel uh, director. You imagine oh, the CIA personnel director moving to um, Iran and just vanishing. Um, th that's the level of the kind of stuff that you see here on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, they, they've they got Taiwan pretty much compromised at every level. So in a war, they won't have any trouble turning the lights off. Mm, that's sad. That's pretty dark. You know what gets me too is, uh, because this issue is a particularly interesting to me, is the penalties that are meted out to those involved in espionage seem to be rather light, hand mm. slaps sometimes. The one exception would be um, the general who got busted a few years ago because he, uh, he was in charge of the Poshang Communications Project and he got, as they say, honeycombed. And, oh, uh, honey excuse me? Honey trapped. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, honey trapped. And um, apparently the U.S. was very upset and they put a lot of pressure on Taiwan to really dole out, um, you know, heavy, he he heavy punishment. And, and apparently Taiwan listened on that. Finally, but, yeah. He, I actually knew him. Uh, he was the head of their NSA, basically. Okay. Their, that's basically the highest position and he was the head of it. And he was recruited outside of uh, Taiwan, possibly in Thailand by a young woman who was working for the Chinese intelligence. Um, 
So, yeah, they found the pressure on putting him away was pretty heavy. But in normal, normally, uh, spies caught here in Taiwan or anywhere in the United States, for example, normally don't receive more than three or four years in prison. Uh, I, I don't get that. I, I, I really have a lot of trouble with that. Well, Greg Bergerson, uh, who was working for the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, spied for China here in Taiwan. He was in charge of the Voshong project. He got three years. And then there was Flandern. I think his name's Flandern. He worked for Pacific Command, also spied for China here in Taiwan. Uh, he got three years. Uh, Su Bin, the guy who spent on the F-35. And we're, we're down to one minute here. Boy, the time really flies. <laughs> hey, let me ask, again, I'm going to ask you this question uh, right at the end. Uh, sorry to do this to you again. But I, I sent you a copy of that article um, uh, by Shirley Kahn, a retired uh, Congressional Research Office analyst, spent her whole life working on Taiwan, China affairs. She feels that Taiwan has missed a lot of opportunities to help itself when it comes to promoting or advancing its own defense. Just, would you buy into that? Sorry, we don't have a whole lot of time to really jump into this, but. Its own defense, perhaps, but it's also been hobbled by a lot of American activities, discouraging you, the Taiwanese from developing cruise missiles that can strike China. Mm. But the U.S. uses Taiwan uh, bases here. Uh, we have a signal intelligence facility here run by the U.S. National Security Agency out of Washington. Right. So we do have facilities here that spy on China, and as well as a sonar uh, facility that operates under the Fisher program under the Japanese with sonars up and down the island chain. Um, oh, that's, that's so, managed by yeah. the Japanese? Hmm? That's managed by the Japanese? That's the fish hook sonar program. Is that, um, they, that's the, the Japanese the sonar military. So we have all the way down the island chain from, from Okinawa to Taiwan. Hmm. Taiwan is part of that program. It's called the fish hook program. Oh, it's wow. secret, so I, it doesn't surprise me you wouldn't know much about it, but look it up. It's I've written about it in the past, fish but hook. the U.S. does dip into intelligence collection by the Taiwanese, and that includes the early warning radar on the on the west coast aimed at China, which is the largest radar in the world. Okay, well, um, I, I think we're going to have to stop here. Um, okay. That clock really is, does us in week after week after week. Thank you very much for watching today. Uh, you, you, um, been watching Asian Review. My guest again has been Wendell Minnick, who, uh, as you saw uh, today and last week, is a wealth of information about Taiwan military affairs. I'm really glad that we could uh, get him to uh, come back and join us again. Uh, thanks again for watching. Uh, thank you, Wendell, for being with us, and uh, we'll see you again next week.